behind me right over here is Dr. Tom Grotus. Uh, and he is a scientist here at the Rutgers University Marine Field Station. And he is working and has been working on a project um, that involves striped bass, um, which is a really, really interesting fish that we have um, not only here in New Jersey, but along a lot of the Atlantic coast uh, and also out in the Pacific as well. Uh, so as far as striped bass go, what, what can we say about observations of striped bass? What do we already know about striped bass? Well, we know that striped bass visit the estuary regularly, and in fact, we know that striped bass have to move up into freshwater in order to spawn, which means to put out their eggs and fertilize those eggs. The young of the striped bass have to spend their first few days in fresh water, and the eggs do, in order to hatch. Um, on the other hand, the adults are very common in uh, marine water out along the coast and even into the uh, into the deeper waters along the shore. So these fish move between salt water and fresh water and they move a lot apparently between the north and the south. Fish are found, uh, striped bass are found from Florida all the way to Nova Scotia and uh, from the seasonal distribution you can observe certainly that some of these are moving. It's not just the same fish spending time in different places. Also from tags which are simply markers on fish, you see that they move great distances. Um, but now we have some new technology that can look at, at uh, if the fish are actually staying here and being caught more, or if, uh, if they actually come and go. Okay, great. So we, we know that striped bass come in and out of the estuary here. Some leave the estuary at certain times of the year and move up and down the coast and the ocean. Right. Um, others come in here at different times of the year to feed and, and spawn and reproduce. Mm -hmm. um, Great, so maybe you can just share with us uh, okay. quickly exactly how you're going about doing that. Because I, as anybody could imagine, it's, it's got to be really difficult to be able to follow fish. They're underwater, they move around a lot. We're not designed to follow them underwater very easily. So obviously it, there's some technologies that you guys have. So Yes, it is very difficult, mostly because it's just very difficult to see. You can see maybe half a meter in these waters or, or a meter under good conditions. And putting a marker on them, sometimes you make it, it uh, the fish is required to be caught sometime later to see if it has moved. And um, in the case of striped bass, they're big enough, you don't have to use an external marker, you can actually use a marker that can be heard from a ways away. And sound travels very well through water, much better than light. So I have a tag here, which is actually an acoustic transmitter. Mostly it's batteries, but there's a, actually a tiny little speaker in there and it's on right now, even though you can't hear it. That's because it's an ultrasound. There's also a little computer chip that gives this tag a particular code to identify it from other similar tags. Um, so you can put this in, the, in a fish, and I'll just pull a fish out of my back pocket here <laughs> and let, uh, let you hold this striped bass. What we do is, is we, we uh, anesthetize these fish, surgically uh, turn them on their backs, when they're uh, unconscious from, from the anesthetic, we'll make a little uh, cut in there and, and push the transmitter inside. Now, the, f the fish that we tag are much bigger than this one, um, at least two or three times the size for the smallest one, because striped bass get big, 50 pounds even. So we put that in there, and we sew it back up with surgical stitches um, and, and let the fish go. And it swims around, and this tag could be heard underwater because, again, the water carries the sound so well, for uh, under great conditions, a mile or more. And under poor conditions, like in a storm where there's lots of other noise, maybe a quarter mile. But we can listen to the fish in a number of ways. This right here is a uh, hydrophone. That's really all there is to it. And this piece of gear right here is a receiver that listens to that hydrophone and has a computer in it that interprets the particular code. So he has a live tag going right there, and you can hear that pinging every five seconds. Now this tag will ping every five seconds for two years. So you have two years over which to hear fish come and go and uh, return to the system or, or stay here. Um, in fact, with a hydrophone like this, which is directional, you see it has a shield around it. Um, you could put this in the water and on a boat and follow a fish and get to within meters of where this fish is and know exactly where it is. 
uh, that's very time consuming for somebody to follow it. Another way to do it is to have a very similar system that's uh, hanging on a buoy out in the water and to replace this line here with an electrical, or excuse me, with a radio signal. So you just add a radio transmitter that takes the sound, turns it into a radio signal and shoots it over here instead of using a cord. And so by that, doing so that, that would basically be wireless, right? That's wireless. Okay. And by doing that, we can place a number of them wide across the estuary wherever a radio can reach them and listen to all of them at the same time. So we could listen to 50 or 60 fish in the river all at the same time, which is much more than somebody in a boat could do it. And the way we've set this up is almost like an easy pass system. Wherever there's a narrow area where fish have to go through like an inlet or a narrow area in the river, just like when cars are moving up and down the parkway and have to get off at certain exits, that's where we'll put these sensors. And so you know when the fish come and go. Wow, that's great. So you ha essentially you have different hydrophones, which are, which are underwater microphones. Yes. And you have them all throughout the estuary so that mm -hmm. as the striped bass swim around with their tags in them, you can track individual fish right. and find out how much time they spend in the estuary or if they go outside the estuary in the ocean or whether they spend the entire year here. That's correct. Great. So that's, wow, that's very interesting. Okay, great. So it's a lot of fun too. Yeah, I would imagine getting out, going out there. And, so do you actually catch, the, how do you catch the fish? Well, we pull them out of our back pocket. No, we, <laughs> we, we, we catch them hook and line. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, so you work with fishermen? Fun. Yes, that's right. We work with, uh, with fishermen that have been fishing in this system for many years and they're a great help to us. Great, and if the fisherman happens to catch a striped bass, because I'm sure we have people from all over the country watching, if somebody were to catch a striped bass that had a tag inside, how would they know that? Well, um, the, the fish do get an external marker tag um, before they're released that says, please release this fish carries an internal transmitter. Sometimes those tags fall off. Sometimes the fish do get caught and eaten, and when they uh, open the fish, they find that. But these are wild fish. They're not pets. They do get eaten. It right. happens. It's great when people uh, return that information to us. That's useful information. The tag itself has a little um, label on it, and so we can actually track, and it helps because we catch fish. People catch fish in Massachusetts or North Carolina, and then we know where the fish is even when it's not in the system. Great. Okay, so my last question is, uh, since you've been doing this project, and I think you've been doing it for, what, two years now? A little bit longer? No, longer, longer since 2002. Years? Okay, great. So a couple of years. Um, have you been able to address your hypothesis then about whether some fish spend the whole year here in the estuary? Well, uh, to, an, to a degree. We have 86 fish tagged so far, and um, they, they show a lot of variation, so you do need quite a few in order to, to be able to say with some certainty um, if the patterns that you see are are widespread or real or if it's an anomaly but we do we do have some fish that stay here almost the whole summer and they return back to the or excuse me spring summer and fall return back to the same places that they've been when they do return and we have other fish that are very very consistently show up the same dates in spring and fall in two different years Great. Wow, and, that sounds uh, really and interesting. Those, and just stayed just for a few days. And we've had one fish that spent a winter here. Wow. And that was the smallest fish. And it may have something to do with uh, how a fish makes a decision whether to, whether to migrate or not. Might Great. be a function of size. Great. Well, thanks for your time and You're for your welcome. explanation. I also want to thank these two guys over here. Maybe you guys can just say your name into the microphone for us. You're from Little Egg Harbor School, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, my name's Jarrett. And my name's Matt. Great, well thanks for helping us out with this segment.